Again, for those of you who have just joined, we are giving people a couple of, of minutes to join the live and we'll get started. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to today's webinar where we are discussing where we are now one month since the end of Title 42. This webinar is brought to you by the American Immigration Council and we'll be digging into what is happening at the border now and we'll hopefully get some insight from our panelists on solutions to the challenges that we're facing at the border. We're grateful that so many of you were able to join us today to discuss this important topic. My name is Alex Miller, and I am the director of the Immigration Justice Campaign here at the Immigration Council. Joining you today from Tucson, Arizona, I am the moderator of today's webinar. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Council, we are a nonprofit organization um, that believes it, that the U.S. immigration system should be fair, just, and welcoming. We pursue this objective through a multi-pronged approach, including impact litigation, advocacy, research, transparency efforts, narrative change and, expect, and expanding access to counsel for immigrants. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, um, we will be responding to questions in the Q&A at the end of the call. And before we jump in, I want to introduce my two uh, wonderful panelists, Aaron Reichland Melnick, the Director of uh, Policy at the American Immigration Council located in DC, and Dylan Corbett, the Executive Director and Founder, I believe, of Hope Border Institute in El Paso. Um, first, I would like to pass the mic to um, to Dylan. So, you know, at the border in El Paso, what is, um, what's, what's going on? What are you seeing a month after the end of Title 42? Uh, thanks, Alex. I uh, appreciate uh, the introduction. And uh, thanks also to Aaron, my co-panelist, and, and to AIC for the invitation to be with you. Um, yeah, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, here at Hope, we do we do research and advocacy on U.S.-Mexico border issues. We're located in uh, West Texas in El Paso, uh, and uh, since uh, the end of 2019, we've also worked in our, our sister city, um, uh, Ciudad Juarez, uh, responding to remain in Mexico with a humanitarian program for migrants um, who were stuck in that city as a result of that policy, and and now other sound denying policies over the past couple of years, Title 42 and and um, even today. Um, so we work on both sides of the border. So um, uh, we've been able to uh, have a perspective uh, that's binational. Um, let, me, let me share some of what uh, has happened uh, since uh, the, the, the great change uh, that we saw on the 11th and the 12th. It's a little complicated because it's not simply that we're rolling back Title 42 and uh, going back to uh, Title Eight, sort of the status quo ante. Rather, we're going from Title 42 um, to Title 8, but also there, there are a number of other different things that are in the mix. There's the asylum uh, transit ban, there's the expanded use of the, um, the asylum processing rule, uh, whereby USCIS is more involved in the processing of asylum seekers at the border. So we're going into this soup of, of different things that are happening, and we're just at the beginning of it. Um, and we're at a time when the numbers have begun to go down, the numbers of arrivals at the border. So there's a variety of things that are happening. Um, we don't have uh, the full picture of data yet from the government um, as to the numbers the, in May. Um, so that'll become clear when CBP publishes its statistics of uh, apprehensions at the Southwest border. Um, but we do know a couple of things. The, the US government um, you know, published uh, a, a press release, I believe on the 6th of June, um, that contains some data um, that, that affirms what we're seeing here 
locally in Juarez and in El Paso. Um, first things, apprehensions. Apprehensions have fallen um, and, and quite significantly. Um, so we went, uh, we went from a situation where we were seeing you know, 10,000 uh, encounters at the US-Mexico border. Um, we were, um, you know, the, the numbers were going up. And I think what happened as we got closer to Title 42 is that many people on the move, vulnerable people on the move, asylum seekers and other vulnerable migrants, um, they were making an educated bet and saying that we wanted to get in under the line before um, before we went into this new regime, this new immigration regime at the border, which as you know, uh, for border crossers who cross in bet between ports of entry, there are new hurdles now that they have to overcome. And so I think on the whole, you can't overestimate that, that people on the move are typically very educated about the policies. They may not know all the inside, ins and outs of it, but I think what you saw as we approached the March, the May 11th, May 12th date is that people were making an educated bet and trying to get in under the line before the change in policy. And so you did see an increase um, in arrivals at the border. Uh, but that's, that's, that's changed now. Under Title uh, Eight, uh, since um, uh, May 12th, the change, um, the encounters at the border um, have gone down significantly. So we're about 3,300, 3,400, I think overall, uh, people who are apprehended in between ports of entry, which is quite low. Uh, relative to where we were for where we were before just the changes um, there uh, have been significant amounts of repatriations um, so here in El Paso we've seen between 250 maybe 300 people uh, deported each day um, over the whole border there's been just under 40,000 repatriations I think 38 uh, 38,500 uh, um, and, and so the deportations have begun, many of them to Mexico, many of them to other countries of origin. But I think what's important to note about these deportations is that they're different. We, we, got, you, we got sensitized to expulsions of different uh, nationalities to Mexico under Title 42, that was quite common. Um, but we've never as a country deported people to Mexico and we're doing that now. And I think that's important because we're putting additional pressures on Mexico um, the populations, um, we're, we're creating vulnerable populations within Mexico. The deportations have been a little bit different though in this sense, whereas under Title 42, we expelled people to Northern Mexican communities. Most of these repatriations or, or deportations to Mexico are actually to the interior of Mexico. And so they're not in Northern border communities like Ciudad Juarez. We've seen people return to Ciudad Juarez, mostly voluntary returns. That's what the population that's being returned to Ciudad Juarez is. Um, there, there, there's still people who are arriving to Ciudad Juarez in Northern Mexican communities. Um, the, the overall shelter capacity in Juarez right now is about 63%, which looks almost exactly what it looks like, looked like a month ago, um, before people began to, to come in greater numbers to the border to get under, uh, to get in under the wire. Um, but I'm worried that we're, we're, we're deporting people to Mexico, we're creating additional burdens on Mexicans, we're, we're deporting people to, play, to communities that might not have the resources that Northern Mexican communities have in terms of shelter and other wraparound services, which are not sufficient, um, but they're more than places like Tapachula, they're more than, than places um, like in the interior of Mexico. So that, that bothers me. There are three, the three top nationalities of people who have been returned or deported rather, uh, have been Mexico, about 1200 people per day, uh, Honduras, um, just over 500 people per day, and then Guatemala, uh, but more than 360 per day. Many of the deportations from El Paso have been from Guatemala. Many of the people who are crossing between ports of entry and being deported are from Guatemala. And of course the US has an agreement whereby we can return directly to Guatemala. Um, there have been a lot of people, uh, the, 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 um, the asylum processing rule whereby USCIS is administering a significant portion of the, the asylum processing at the border, that's happening. Um, so there have been about 12,000, just under 12,000 um, uh, CFIs that have been administered by the USCIS. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but that's happening. So as we move into this new, new, new phase under Title VIII, um, that, that sort of rushed process, and I'll talk about why it can be, why it's a little bit troubling um, is, is happening. So that's apprehensions. Now we look at CBP-1. So we're leaning, the government's now leaning on CBP-1. It's really the main tool to process asylum seekers at the border. So every day we're processing just over a thousand people 
um, daily across eight ports of entry. Um, that includes a place like Ciudad Juarez, El Paso. Right now it's seven, because if you saw the news, um, we suspended the processing that's happening in Laredo and Nuevo Laredo uh, because of some abuses that are happening there. There's extortion that's happening. Um, people are being pressured once their appointments do come up um, to pay um, extortion in order to be able to access asylum. It's a bit troubling. We saw something similar under the Trump administration with metering in places like the RGV in South Texas, in Tijuana. There was lots of exploitation, lots of corruption around that process. I hope that we're not seeing a repeat of that um, across the border, but definitely something's happening in Laredo and the government has had to suspend that. So we've seen a few more people processed in, in El Paso now as a result of that. Um, the government uh, at the top of the month on June expanded the amount of people being processed on a daily basis a little bit from about 1,000 to 1,250. So we're seeing a, a few more people here in El Paso that are being processed under that. Um, in El Paso, it looks about like 150 to 170 people per day are coming through the ports of entry, just one port of entry here in El Paso um, via the CBP-1 uh, process. Um, there are the top three nationalities for, for CBP-1 um, users are Haiti, Mexico, and Venezuela. Uh, monthly, if, if you average uh, that daily amount, uh, to, 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 if you sort of um, you know, look at the monthly rate, it's about, it's about 33,000 persons per month. If you uh, expand that you know, to an annual number, you're talking about you know, about 400,000 people perhaps that we could be processing on an annual basis for CBP-1. So nothing to sneeze at. This is actually quite significant. Although there are problems with CBP-1 um, and, and it's not right to, to limit asylum seekers, just the use of CBP-1. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the Mexicans, for example, especially because we're seeing a lot of Mexicans who are crossing between ports of entry. Um, I'm worried that, you know, we're, you know, we may be looking at situations of Ray Fomont, uh, but, but CBP-1, in a sense, with its many defects, um, we, are, we are processing people at, at a good clip, if, if, if you look at those numbers on a monthly and then annualize them basis. So um, with all that, what's, what are some things that are not going right? Um, CBP-1, obviously, we should not be restricting asylum uh, to people who can only use CBP-1. Um, there's, a, there's another thing that's troubling me. Um, you know, families, uh, I'm, I'm seeing families being separated by this process. Let me give you a quick example. Um, just for, you know, uh, as, we, as we made the change from Title 42 to Title 8, um, we've been operating a shelter. We, we stood up a shelter in anticipation of the change, uh, which we are, we've been operating until just this week. And the numbers have gone down now sufficiently where we can close that US shelter. But in our shelter, we were able to deal with a lot of people who came in under the wire and then afterwards. Um, and there was a, a mom who came in uh, under the new process, um, had fallen off a train, uh, broken her leg in six places. Uh, she came with one of her children. But so mom and child were on this side of the border, but dad and the other child were on the other side of the border. Um, and every day uh, since uh, May 12th, um, they've been trying to use CBP-1 to get over and it hasn't worked. Um, and, and that gives you a sense of that CBP-1 is not working for everyone it needs to work for. There are some people, you know, because CBP-1 does not prioritize vulnerabilities, um, it's sort of a first come first serve um, type design. There's no way to prioritize vulnerabilities. Um, there's, some, there's some issues there. And then families, we've seen families divided in so many ways because of this. Um, so families, uh, you know, CBP-1 is just not working. Um, it's having an impact on families. I'm worried too that we're outsourcing the problem to Mexico. I've already mentioned that. Um, that's a significant thing, um, but it looks like that's gonna be a permanent dimension now of the US's strategy at the border. Um, and there are a lot of problems associated with that, especially because we're seeing now so many people, so much internal uh, displacement within Mexico um, and the services available for asylum seekers who have to be at the border for an extended period of time, uh, they just aren't there. Um, I'm worried about unscheduled asylum seekers. Um, not everyone who's a, who presents at the border, um, and we, we've recorded some situations of this, has been able to access asylum. So ostensibly, people should be able to walk up to ports and be able to claim asylum, um, even under this new regime. I can tell you that's not always happening. It's happening for some people, um, but the ports have not, uh, are not prioritizing capacity for that population, so that worries me. 
I'm also worried about those rush adjudications under the new process um, with USCIS, uh, particularly because uh, many people in order to go through that process have to identify an attorney within 24 hours. In El Paso, just baseline without any of these policies, we don't have enough attorneys uh, for everyone in detention, for everyone who needs legal services. So to add this, uh, you know, these, these, this new situation onto that, it's not really realistic for a population like El Paso. Our largest legal service for services provider is open Monday through Friday, it's a, it's a charity. Um, many people have to have their adjudications on the weekends. Um, and, and so, you know, they're not able to access legal services on the weekends. Um, and because the deportations are happening further away from the border, we're not always able to monitor and get good data on who is being removed, or deported, why, what that standard looks like. We need good data on that. Um, we've had situations in our shelter where a traveling partner or family member has been removed to Mexico, deported, uh, but the person fleeing the same situation is in our shelter. And so there seems to be a disparity in how those adjudications are being um, are being managed. So it's something that we're, we're concerned about. There's not a lot of transparency. It happens very quickly. Um, so we need some good data on that to understand what's exactly happening and, and the impact on people's due process. Another thing that concerns me, thinking about the situation in Harlingen where there was the death of a child, we still need to learn more about the situation, but it doesn't look good. There's some systematic um, problems within Border Patrol with the treatment of people who need medical care. Congress has appropriated funds, for example, to Border Patrol to be able to provide non-uniform personnel um, to, to, to meet the healthcare needs of people in, in the custody of Border Patrol. I don't think Border Patrol has even hired anybody for those positions that have been appropriated by Congress. Um, and, and you see situations, unfortunate situations like this that should be avoided. So I'm worried about that. A few things that are going right. CPP1, again, it's working at a fairly good clip. So even though there's a lot of criticisms, it has a lot of equity issues. Um, it's clearly not meeting the needs everyone needs to. There's no prioritization based on vulnerability. Um, it's taking too long. It's still happening in a good clip. Um, and again, it shouldn't be the only tool in our toolbox. It shouldn't be used to the exclusion of people who need to cross between ports of entry. Um, but it's working um, to get people into the United States who need protection. Family groupings, um, even though I criticized this a moment ago, a lot of the people in our shelter um, had been separated during the custody uh, experience, but then they, they had been um, uh, released together and or released at the same part in, in the same area. Um, we saw people who were separated, uh, a mom, for example, who was separated from her child who was sent all the way to Houston, which is about 12 hours away from El Paso, I think. Um, Texas could be another country. We think it's another country. So it was on the other part of the other side of the country for us. Um, but on the whole, there's an April 20th uh, memo um, within CBP that says that family groupings, families should be linked to prioritize similar outcomes. And it sort of expands the notion of family a little bit. So we're pushing, we're getting a better definition of family. We need to do much more. But I did see that the word, that, that memo has been observed you know, Paso, again, not all, all the time, um, but we're making progress in that, in that area. And I think that's something to celebrate and we need to keep pushing. Capacity, Border Patrol has real a significant capacity here now in El Paso. A year ago, we didn't have permanent capacity. <laughs> it's hard to think about that, but now we have three facilities um, that can take on paper 5,500 people and in an emergency situation between 10 and 12,000 people. We didn't have that in El Paso. That's a game changer with when the Border Patrol has that, 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 that capacity to be able to process people. And um, we've seen people here in El Paso, the, 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 the custody centers for Border Patrol were at 6,000 at a certain point when we, went, when we had the transition. And we were able to manage that. Um, so having that, that capacity um, is key. And then the last thing that's going right, FEMA funding. Um, our county has done enormous um, work in, in being able to, to utilize some of those FEMA resources um, in order to, to be able to transport people outbound to Canby uh, same day to release the pressure here on the border. Um, other organizations have been able to access that to provide additional hospitality. So it's increased our hospitality capacity. It's increased the capacity of our local government. Um, and so that, that FEMA, those FEMA resources are key and we need to keep pushing to make sure that those are stable over time 
um, because they really have helped out in a, in a significant way and built permanent capacity, I think, if we can keep getting those appropriations moving um, here in El Paso. Um, so that's been good. And then I'll just finish uh, with one thing, if I can, I can share my, my screen. I just wanna share a, a picture. Um, we closed the shelter this week. This picture is shared with the permission of, of um, the parents uh, and the people in the picture. Um, but I just wanna bring, bring us back to the human dimension of this. Um, you know, the, the habit, we, we usually do our hospitality work on the Juarez side. Uh, we've done a little bit on the El Paso side, but this, you know, we, we had the opportunity to help a lot of people. Um, we cared in El Paso, I think we had more people under our care um, on average during this last month than any other facility. So it was a stress and it was, it was difficult, but it was a joy. These are new Americans who are all excited to move on to their communities of destination and be part of our communities, contribute to work, uh, to take care of themselves and their family. Um, these are not folks that we should be afraid of. Um, the, it was transformative for us as a team, as a community. And I know that, um, that they'll be transformative in the communities of, of destination to which they're going. Um, and I just wanted to share that joy because we forget that these aren't just names and figures, but they're people with stories and aspirations and hopes and desires. Um, and when we welcome, um, we're so much better off. And I'll stop there. Thank you for that, Dylan. I think it's incredibly important to, to ground these conversations in um, what is real, what is human, right? We're not talking about numbers of apprehensions. We're talking about people with individual stories um, who are living through um, the US's policies and are experiencing our policies in a way that can be really detrimental. And there's an, an, an incredible um, welcome that we could offer. Um, and to see people choose to offer that welcome, is it's a really important choice to make. Um, I want to remind some folks who have their hands up that um, they can please use the question and answer feature and that um, this webinar is recorded and will be shared. So do not, uh, do not worry, there will be other opportunities to see and hear from us. But I do wanna pass the mic to my colleague, Erin. Um, Dylan spoke in passing about some policies that are being implemented at the border and want to dig a little bit deeper on what those policies are and what they mean at a practical level. I'm talking about the asylum ban and um, the re increased reliance on expedited removal in CBP custody and, and you know, CBP-1, which Dylan mentioned as well. Like, what does that constellation of policies look like? What does it mean for asylum seekers? Thanks, Alex. And, and thank you also, Dylan, for a very, very comprehensive look at like what is actually playing out on the ground in El Paso. So I'm, I'm going to pull out a little bit from that like really granular look and sort of say, what are the policies that the Biden administration is using here and sort of explain a little bit more. Um, so I really want to start with this expanded use of expedited removal and this new asylum restriction. So under Title 42, I think it's a very cr crucial to distinguish what is Title 42 versus what is Title 8. So when we say Title 8, what that just means is immigration law. That Title 8 is literally a physical book where you can find the entirety of the Immigration and Nationality Act. Um, you know, it's a volume where all immigration law goes. So when we talk about Title 8 processing, we're referring to normal immigration law processing under our U.S. immigration laws, as opposed to Title 42, which was processing under public health laws. And public health laws, of course, didn't have anything about asylum or any basic rights to avoid removal. It was a public health policy that allowed people to be expelled without ever letting them access the rights that they are given under Title VIII, which is, again, immigration law. So now we are back in the world of immigration law. And the world of immigration law includes the right to be screened for asylum. Since 1980, any person who was arriving in the United States who was physically present in the United States has had the right to apply for asylum. But how they access that right varies. Individuals who are already inside the country, if they are here entering legally or entered undocumented without being picked up at the border, can simply file an asylum application with US Citizenship and Immigration Services. But uh, under a law passed in 1996, people arriving at the border who are taken into custody are generally placed through a process known as expedited removal. 
expedited removal uh, is a rapid uh, process by which the US government can issue deportation orders, except for people who are claiming persecution or uh, who have expressed a fear of, of uh, persecution in their home country if deported there. And the process to determine whether or not they can avoid that order of expedited removal, like a rapid deportation order, is the credible fear interview process. So um, that process has normally occurred in historic uh, purposes in ICE detention centers because it requires a lot of resources on the part of the Department of Homeland Security. You need an asylum officer who is going to carry out that interview. You need a place for somebody to be held in detention for several days while they go through this process. You need an immigration judge, connections to an immigration judge um, who can do a potential review if the person is found not to have a credible fear because there's a right of review. And so historically, this has all occurred in ICE detention because that's where the resources were to do that. But in 2019, in late 2019 and continuing into 2020, um, and uh, the Trump administration first piloted credible fear um, uh, interviews in Border Patrol custody. This was a brand new thing that hadn't been done before. That was known as the PACER and HARP programs. Uh, and that program ended under the Biden administration. President Biden actually signed an executive order ending the policy. And yet here we are two years later after he signed that executive order with the Biden administration having basically brought that policy back. Uh, so the issue that we're seeing right now with the Biden administration is that uh, PACER and HARP, um, the revived program, so the Biden administration is not calling that, is leading to people having these expedited screenings in Border Patrol custody. These people are given 24 to 48 hours after they cross the border to recover from the difficulty of crossing, all while held in Border Patrol detention centers where the lights are never turned off and they don't have a bed to sleep on. Um, and, you know, there are border agents going in and out all times of the day, really making it very hard for people to sleep. You know, after 24 or 48 hours, they get an inter they get taken into a room there. They are given essentially one day to attempt to connect with an attorney, which is nearly impossible because uh, most people don't know an attorney and most attorneys are not able to drop everything and uh, help somebody who's detained in a border patrol facility. Um, and then after that, they get, uh, you know, so this is now within three days or so of crossing the border, they get their credible fear interview. These are, again, people who may not have even been able to sleep in the last 72 hours because they're in a Border Patrol cell with the lights never turning off, constant noise, constant everything, where it's just very, very difficult to, uh, to concentrate on what may be the most important interview of their life. So if they pass that interview and have found to have a credible fear, then we know the Biden administration is by and large releasing people in that circumstance. If they fail the credible fear interview, then within 24 to 48 hours, they will have a review by an immigration judge and with the Biden administration saying that their goal is to get people through this process within a week. So basically, they can churn out these denials, which is what we're saying here. Dylan mentioned that they've already carried out you know, nearly 12,000 credible fear interviews in Border Patrol custody since the end of Title 42. And we expect that the uh, majority of those are, are likely denials given the circumstances. Uh, so that is one thing the Biden administration is doing. And uh, crucially, however, that program of expedited uh, processing is not being done for everybody. And the key exception right here is families. Uh, so far, they are only putting so-called single adults through this process. And I will note on unaccompanied children who are crossing, unaccompanied children, their processing has not changed at all because um, by federal law, they cannot be put through this credible fear process. They get to go straight to immigration. So that hasn't changed. Um, but we are seeing, however, families continue to be released Many are being placed on a program known as the Family Expedited Removal Management Program, um, in which families are being, the head of household is being given an ankle monitor or a GPS wrist bracelet, um, and they're being uh, required to be subject to a curfew and house arrest, essentially, so that they can go through a credible fear interview outside of detention, potentially being held you know, either at a USCIS asylum office or over the phone, um, once the person is essentially under house arrest, passed there. So we are seeing a shift now. Single adults crossing the border are increasingly being detained and deported and subject to these rapid screenings, while families uh, do continue to be released. Um, and however, many of them are also still being sent back to Mexico. 
So this we've seen the administration really ramp up the border enforcement being carried out for people who are crossing the border between ports of entry. But as Dylan said, we are seeing expanded use of the CBP-1 app and options for people to cross the border at ports of entry. With the Biden administration really trying to set up what it's really articulated over the last six months, a carrot and stick policy of border management. This is opposed to the last administration that was all stick and very and no carrot whatsoever. This administration is a lot of stick and some carrot. Uh, the carrot here is the fact that under um, the asylum restriction that they put in place uh, a month ago, people who enter the U.S. at ports of entry with a CBP-1 appointment are exempt from those asylum restrictions. So now the administration has, to its credit, significantly expanded um, access to asylum ports of entry such that they will be admitting about 40,000 people a month through the CBP-1 process. And so they are really trying to divert people from the dangerous uh, route of crossing between ports of entry and instead encouraging them to go to the ports of entry using this appointment process because the appointment process is significantly easier for the Department of Homeland Security. You know, if they know exactly how many people are going to be showing up at a port of entry in any given day, they can prepare for that, they can have the resources to hand, and they can ensure that people are processed without minimal difficulty on both sides, to difficulty to the migrant and difficulty to the U.S. government. By contrast, of course, when people cross the border between ports of entry, the Border Patrol isn't given forewarning that they're going to show up. And so it is a lot more challenging for the U.S. government when that happens, even though, of course, people have a right to seek asylum. So we have seen, as everything Dylan described here, is really, I think, the Biden administration um, really leaning into this carrot and stick policy change. And we've also seen, for example, an expansion of a new process known as regional process, new system known as regional processing centers that are actually going to be set up south of our borders. The first of these regional processing centers is opening in Costa Rica. Uh, it supposedly opened this week and will allow Venezuelans and Nicaraguans who were present in Costa Rica as of June 12th, so that's a present in Costa Rica as of Monday, to be able to go to a um, seguridad movilidad, like a secure mobility office, um, which is what they're calling them, and be screened to see whether or not they qualify for some form of relief in the United States, like refugee status or parole or um, legal immigration by some other means. And if they do, then that basically gives the U.S. an opportunity to sort of take those people out of the pool of potential migrants who would come to the U.S.-Mexico border. We are really curious about how these regional processing centers are going to work, and they seem more part of the carrot side of things than any kind of stick, though, of course, there are a lot of questions around that, because when the United States announced this, they also suggested that Costa Rica may, in fact, carry out its own immigration enforcement against people it determines do not qualify, you know, the United States determines don't qualify for any form of status, or indeed maybe don't even qualify for status in Costa Rica. So there we could see these offices potentially operating as uh, an excuse for countries south of our border who are our allies to step up their own immigration enforcement. And in fact, we've seen stories that the Biden administration is you know, actively considering funding more planes for Guatemala to carry out its own deportation flights so that Guatemala can be deporting people before they even make it to Mexico. And then of course, then Mexico deports people before they even make it to the United States. And we see the US border sort of apparatus, security apparatus moving further and further south. Uh, so I think um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Alex to sort of talk about what she's seeing in Arizona. But I think what this shows is that the US is, is really trying to do this as a strategy, not just that happens at the border, but one that starts much further down in the region. Thank you, Aaron. And I think that's exactly right to the point that, you know, Dylan had raised earlier about kind of externalizing the process to Mexico. You see that externalization moving deeper and deeper um, into Central and, and South America. Um, I'm going to really quickly touch on some of the things we're seeing in Arizona. I think so much of the context that Dylan provided for El Paso uh, applies somewhat universally, though each geographical context is, is slightly different. Again, grounding this in the fact that we're talking about people and lived experience, right? Like these are policies that have a profound human impact. And what we're seeing by and large in Arizona is 
you know, as much as CBP-1 has increased uh, uh, custom border protection capacity to process individuals at the border, it's not enough. There are not enough um, uh, spots, and it has created a hierarchy um, for who is able to actually have access to asylum uh, and, 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 you know, normal asylum outside of the, the strictures of the asylum transit ban and to not be subjected to rapid CFI uh, processing in, in CBP custody, um, but also who has to wait and, and wait in, in danger. Um, individuals are struggling to get CBP-1 uh, appointments in, in, um, in Sonora, uh, in, in Mexico, and are being forced to wait in, in relatively dangerous conditions for their turn to approach the border and to seek asylum at, at the port of entry. Um, and we know that asylum access is not supposed to be determined based on how you enter the United States. And so there's a, a serious problem with the application of, of this asylum transit ban, creating a, 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 a situation where individuals are being denied, potentially denied access to asylum because of their manner of entry and not because of the merits of their underlying claim. Um, it means that people are being forced to make impossible decisions. Do I wait for that CBP-1 appointment um, so that I might have a chance at seeking asylum? Or if I'm facing imminent danger um, in Mexico, do I have to make that more immediate decision to try to get myself to safety? And that's a really, really um, unfair position to, to be put in. I think it's also important to point out in the context of Arizona, Nogales is the only port of entry that has CBP-1 appointments. Uh, and that means the, the only port of entry in Arizona, but also the only port of entry for hundreds of miles in either direction that has CBP-1 appointments. And right now, I believe it's 55 appointments per day. So when you talk about the expansion of capacity border-wide based on CBP-1, that's not really something that we're seeing realized in Arizona, and that has really significant consequences for asylum seekers south of the border uh, in Sonora, Mexico. Um, I want to turn the mic back um, briefly to Aaron before we turn to questions, knowing that we're, you know, running a little bit close on time. We talked a lot about some of the challenges and the issues we're facing. Um, and some of the positives, um, some of the positive changes that we've seen under the, the current administration. Erin, what do we actually want? Like, what, what, what does an actual solution look like when we're talking about the border? Yeah, I think that's really the, the, the key question here. Like, what can actually be done or what should be done? Because, of course, there's different questions between what should be done and what can be done. So I'm going to talk right now about what I think should be done. Um, and a lot of these recommendations come from a report that some of the people may be familiar with that we put out a month ago called Beyond a Border Solution. And what this report argues is that the situation we have at the border today doesn't, you know, fixing that, addressing that solution doesn't require us to completely toss out the current system and restart it over again. What it actually requires is investing the resources into our humanitarian protection system that we haven't done. Um, and the number I come back to is, is $8 spent on immigration enforcement just over the last four years for every $1 that we spent on the immigration courts and on asylum adjudication. You know, we spent nearly $37 billion in four years on Border Patrol and ICE. By comparison, we only spent about $4.5 billion on the immigration courts and USCIS's asylum and refugee operations. So it's not a surprise with that kind of significant resource mismatch that we are in a situation where we find ourselves with 2 million cases in the immigration court system, 1.3 million pending asylum applications, and people being asked to wait four or five years for, a court, for their court process to conclude and potentially four or five years even to get into court. Because we've sort of fundamentally underfunded the adjudication and processing side of our immigration enforcement system. Um, and so our recommendations in this report, which I'm gonna share in the chat, uh, are for, and let me just, I'm sharing that now. Oh, thank you, Alex has already done that, thank you. So um, our, our recommendations are basically on the order of make processing work. So specifically, you know, you heard Dylan talk about the ways in which El Paso today, and especially the El Paso Border Patrol today is far better prepared 
than it was a few years ago. And I've seen this in, in, in operation. The first time I went to a family detention center was in 2015. And seeing the infrastructure and processes that existed at the border nine, you know, eight years ago compared to what they are today is like night and day. The networks that have emerged to manage migration in a lot more comprehensive manner without with limiting disruption on border communities is very different. But as we've seen in El Paso, it's still not enough. There are still times when there are simply too many people crossing for the border patrol and local communities to handle that and process that in a um, in an easy manner and in a way without disrupting other things. And so we've called, for example, for hiring more border patrol processing coordinators. These are people who are doing the paperwork, uh, welfare checks, and sort of bureaucratic processes on the back end that border patrol agents really aren't intended to be doing on a large scale. You know, border patrol agents would prefer to be out in the field patrolling the border. Um, they would prefer not to be back in the border patrol stations, you know, feeding children, doing paperwork, and making sure that, um, uh, you know, commu interagency communication is going on perfectly. And so right now, as of, as of December of last year, there were only about a thousand Border Patrol coordinators total. We know the administration has been hiring more, but we think that, you know, even that is clearly not enough. So in terms of there, it's about processing capacity. Right now, the system has bottlenecks on bottlenecks on bottlenecks. Throughout the system, when you reach points where there are too many people accessing it, too many people being processed and things like that, the system starts breaking down. And we have seen the deadly consequences of that. Last month, an eight-year-old died in Border Patrol custody at a time when Border Patrol facilities were as overcrowded as they haven't been for four years, as overcrowded as 2019 when multiple children died. And we've seen, so therefore, what happens when Border Patrol facilities get get overcrowded? And the answer is deaths and, and tragedies. And so the extent to which the Border Patrol can fix this by improving processing capacity, building more facilities that are actually humane and, and not the concrete sort of nightmare Iaveras and Pereiras that have existed for decades at the border. Um, obviously, you know, the Border Patrol still has a very long way to go in having a humane process for everybody. But improvements have undoubtedly been made and more need to be made. And we need to be putting the money into that, into the humanitarian processing side of things, not into the enforcement side of things, which already gets billions of dollars. Similarly, the ports of entry are an area where we can fix things. Right now, as I said, if we're accepting 40,000 people a month through the ports of entry, we can do more than that. Give people a real option and they will not be crossing the border without permission. Give them the real option to go to a safe port of entry and have a real process, not one that may make force them to wait five months in Mexico before they win a CBP-1 lottery. Then you will transform how we process people at the border. And then crucially, I want to focus on one more recommendation I make in the report, which is the federal government needs to do a better job of coordinating what happens after migrants leave federal custody. Because right now, once a person is released by CBP or ICE, from the point of view of the federal government, what happens next is not up to them. It, it really, they don't, they don't care that much. And that's why you're hearing a lot of local communities saying, where is the Biden administration leading on this? And part of the reason they're not leading on this is because they kind of view that as once somebody leaves DHS custody, it's their problem. They, they can figure out where to go next. So we've called for the creation of a Center for Migrant Coordination that would bring together the Department of Homeland Security, as well as state and local communities and NGOs into having one centralized location to coordinate what happens after migrants leave custody at the border. That could be talking with the city of El Paso at the same time as it's talking with the shelters, at the same time as it's talking with the receiving communities and saying, okay, well, New York can take 100 people tomorrow, you know, Los Angeles can take others. When you have people who don't have anywhere to go, who don't know anybody, what do you do in that circumstances? The federal government could be leading, and we think the Center for Migrant Coordination is the idea. And if Congress were to step in as well and authorize the center, you could have it doing even more, potentially even setting up satellite offices and receiving communities to help give people case management services and walk them through the process to really limit any kind of impact on receiving communities by ensuring that there is that coordination in place and that it's not up to every community to figure out between themselves what's going on. So I know we're at the 45 minute mark and we had initially uh, planned to close here, but I'm hoping I can keep the panelists on for another five minutes 
just so we can get to uh, some of the brilliant questions I see here in the chat. Uh, one of which I would like to take because I think it kind of touches on this, the notion of coordination and, and building of infrastructure. There's a question here about right to counsel and um, whether the government is investing in, in access to counsel. And I, I think it's a really important question. And, and the answer is in certain contexts, yes, but by and large, no. You know, Dylan mentioned in, in passing that one of the main challenges with the uh, CFIs that are happening rapidly in CBP custody is that having individuals in CBP custody restricts their access to counsel. The government has created phone booths so that people can theoretically call out to a list of service providers that may or may not respond. But as he said, you know, people are are, are having CFIs on, on weekends and, and maybe beyond office hours. And the number of nonprofit organizations that are able to respond do not match the need and the demand for counsel. And this is particularly striking and particularly challenging in the context of the asylum ban when the standard that asylum seekers will have to make to pass their credible fear interviews is way higher than it has been historically. Um, and so, you know, the dream would be expanding access to counsel and actual investment from the federal government in expanding access to counsel in a, in a real way. But the reality, you know, looking at the, the work I do with the Immigration Justice Campaign is that we're trying to coordinate and scale pro bono services for individuals, and it's just a band-aid. We need a longer term solution and investment in, in, in access to counsel. Um, Aaron, I saw that you flagged a couple of things that you wanted to respond to. One of those I believe is about returns to Mexico and are other nationalities being returned to Mexico? Is that restricted to Cubans, Nicaraguans, Venezuelans and Haitians? Um, I thought maybe you could respond to what is going on there. Yeah, so uh, this is, I, I actually would love to, if Dylan could chime in on that one, because I'm actually not sure. I think the answer is that it is so far the voluntary returns is Mexicans, Cubans, Haitians, Venezuelans, and Nicaraguans. Um, I don't know for sure whether we're seeing Guatemalans, because as Dylan mentioned, Guatemalans, Hondurans, and Salvadorans can be rapidly deported directly from Border Patrol custody. Um, I'm actually going to put a fact sheet in, in the chat on this is as a result of a program known as electronic nationality verification, uh, which the Trump administration started a few years ago, which allows them to sort of quickly deport people without ever having to send them to ICE detention. So, uh, Dylan, I'm curious if you're seeing other nationalities. Yeah, no, that's correct. Um, those, are, those are the nationalities. Um, and um, I, I, I just I said this before, but I'll repeat it. This is the first time where we're doing it. Um, again, we, we did expulsions uh, back to Mexico of non-Mexican nationals under Title 42, but those were, that was different. These are deportations. And these deportations, remember, these are carrying consequences. You know, the, there's a five-year ban, uh, for example. Um, so if we're placing people within Mexico, you know, we're creating vulnerable communities uh, within Mexico. Um, the, 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 there, you know, there, there's that, that raises some moral and ethical questions. There was another question I think in the in the chat about, you know, how we're, you know, how we're 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 going to be pressuring Mexico to address the needs of families and individuals that are already there. If we're now creating, you know, deporting populations to Mexico, you know, do we have a certain responsibility um, to make sure that Mexico has the capacity and the funding to be able to address this, or are we repeating the paradigm that that, Al, uh, that uh, Aaron talked about, whereby the investments are primarily towards militarization of borders, criminalization of migrants? You know, we're repeating that paradigm, and, and as as Aaron said, just bring it further south. We're leaning on Mexico to to do the dirty work of enforcement, and that's happening. We're doing it just as as he said. You know, so I, I think we're we're replicating the paradigm that we have at the border. The, I, I loved the the point about the investments because that 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 you know that puts it the, you know it, that's the problem in a nutshell. We're treating what's happening at the border as if it were a law enforcement situation or a national security situation rather than a humanitarian situation, and so we're not making the appropriate investments. And now we're leaning on other countries to do the same, including Mexico, including Guatemala. As Aaron said, we're leaning on Guatemala now to 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 um, step up its enforcement and create a, a gendarmerie similar to what Mexico created, 
the National Guard, which you know exists primarily to patrol migrants. But these solutions ultimately aren't sustainable. They don't work and they, they, they result in, in gross violations of human rights. That's absolutely right. Migration is a reality. Um, and when we're talking about forced migration, we need to have humane solutions. Um, I see a number of questions in here about CBP-1 and the nexus between CBP-1 and, and CFIs and what happens after individuals are processed at the border. And I want to take a stab at answering some of that. And of course, Dylan, Aaron, jump in if, if you can. Um, but um, one of the questions is, do you have a sense about success rates for entry following CBP-1 interviews? CBP-1 is by and large a scheduling mechanism. It is not an, an interview. And so most people who schedule an appointment to present at the port of entry through CBP-1 are able to enter. There are some rare exceptions um, based on you know, factors particular to those cases, but by and large, those individuals are permitted to enter the United States. Some are detained, but many are released into the United States and are able to seek asylum. They are not being um, subjected to this rapid CFI process uh, that Aaron and Dylan were describing. Um, as far as what happens to people after they're processed at the border, it, it's it's a, a full alphabet of potential outcomes. And you know, since we've gone over already, I don't think we can can fully dig into that. Um, but it'll have to be a subject for another webinar. Um, Dylan, Aaron, any any closing thoughts? I think we're we're seven minutes over, and I want to respect both of um, your times. I'll chime in really quickly to say, you know, right now we're in a little bit of a lull going on at the border, and this is a time for I think people to sort of regroup and make sure that support continues to those doing the work at the border. Um, even if the headlines, you know, the national news media moves away and you don't see headlines about this every single day, the people who are on the border doing this work are still doing it day in and day out and they need support. Um, and I, I think that is a very crucial thing to keep in mind. Thanks for that. Um, and, um, you know, we felt the love uh, from the community of immigration advocates throughout the country um, and the support. Um, and so, um, we're, we're thankful for, for the spotlight that you all are putting on these realities and for the support that you've been able to send our way. Very grateful for that. Um, I think, you know, we're in a mixed reality now. Um, in broad strokes, you know, under the Trump administration, we pushed the problem to Mexico and, and, um, and under this new mixed reality, there's now a lot of need on both sides of the border in El Paso and in Mexico. Um, it's a mixed sort of reality. Um, We've got to we've got to sort of rebuild from within, whereby we, um, you know, move to a more humanitarian approach. I'll just say one thing, based on my experience this past month, um, in the shelter we had um, the Red Cross. Um, they 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 had some personnel and they were able to give some supplies. And um, you know, five years ago we wouldn't have had the Red Cross at the border. We didn't see this as again a humanitarian issue. Um, but just that little thing, the presence of the Red Cross, the, the water that they were able to provide, um, you know, the personnel, the volunteers that they were able to deploy, we're beginning poco a poco, little by little, I think, to transform from within the system to move to that more humanitarian approach. But we're going to need to keep pushing. This is something that we're going to need everybody uh, to be engaged in. Um, but I believe it's possible. I really do believe it's possible. We can put in place a humane system that works for people, especially the most vulnerable at the border. Um, and so keep pushing, please. Um, you're making a difference. Thank you, Dylan and Aaron. That's absolutely right. None of this work can be done in isolation. It requires a resounding response from the community. It requires support for nonprofit organizations like the ones we work at, but many, many, many other organizations that are doing incredible work at the border and in communities that are receiving and supporting migrants. I wanna thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you found this presentation informative and engaging. As a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be emailed to all registrants soon, and we will have other webinars uh, queued up and planned in the near future, so please watch out for those invitations. Thank you again for joining us today. Bye, everyone. <laughs>